we're gonna get started but um there are a lot of it's a little bit mathy some ways and uh i'm not quite you know fun with this mask um but let's get started and maybe we can learn along so um the book started to pain um about um you know uh how neural network becomes formula popular in this year and uh, what happened is like uh, is somehow a hype that it can solve all problem. Uh, but um, uh, when the uh, some classical machine learning algorithm comes, like SBM, um, Random Forest, um, there was what is called AI Winter, where all the AI, um, you know, uh, deep neural networks go uh, away uh, and the funding fade away and some stuff like that. I think um, that's the second AI winter in 1990s. I think it was in 70s when there was first AI winter. So there was two AI winters when the neural network goes and come back and stuff like that. And the um, reemergence of deep ne uh, neural networks um, uh, been called deep learning is in 2010. And now it's one of the most successful, um, you know, um, machine learning um, techniques that being used today. Um, uh why this deep learning is becoming more popularized because of a lot of factors number one coming up with uh, software tools like pytorch you know that they implement all these like back propagation you know they implement all the workflow from a to z how to train your deep learning so this actually uh previously they were saying like um you need to code this from you know scratch but this was and also um availability of data so now, because you know we uh, in digital era, everything is digitized, so data is quite abundant, and deep learning works well when we have um, you know large amount of uh, data available. So these are some of, and also um, the hardware, right? So now we have GPUs um, that can be used to train model. Uh, not previously, where you have like uh, you know only CPU and so. So these are some of the things that you know push forward the um, emergence and resurfacing of deep learning and some of the top people these are three guys yellow con hinton and yoshua yoshua benjo um so these are some of the people at the forefront um so the first what they discuss is about single layer neural network um where we have um so basically in uh uh um for any neural network it has three kind of layers input layer hidden layers and output layers so here we can see like this is input um, uh, hit layers at worst um, uh, a deep, any neural network must have at least one hidden layer. So here we have one hidden layer, we have output layer. And what happened is like these are some of the features when you want to do. And now in this hidden layer, that's where something happens. Um, the learning tech plays. Uh, there are some kind of a uh, function called uh, activation function. And now you output uh, stuff here at output layer you use uh, several functions such as sigmoid to calculate what you have um okay uh, yeah so um here we um this one uh at this hidden layer we have what is called activation function because what happened is that um, uh, whatsoever here you can see some uh, from different input so this that is activation function that takes and now uh okay this one um we can see like um uh i cannot interpret these um <laughs> the mathematical stuff um anyone can interpret what this activation means so i think it this a weight here and now here we have the weight and also the you know um uh, uh, our futures uh we multiply the weight and the futures um from the first one to p whatsoever um, so this is basically the activation function. So we have many activation functions. Uh, we have um, ReLU, we have Sigmoid, um, but the one that is widely used here is Sig um, ReLU. Yep, um, ReLU is why uh, is used. Uh, but also, um, um, yeah, so uh, activation function in Hidele are typically nonlinear. So what they mean is that all the activation function that I use are uh, nonlinear because if we use a linear function, uh, uh, because we can see here, this is what happened. You have many layers 
may we one layer another layer another layer another layer so when you have um you know um uh, linear functions then the output will be linear at the end so that's why the um hidden activation functions they are not linear they give an example in the book where uh, you can see like how what they mean by saying that the activation function must be non linear uh, where they give linear cool linear function and when doing the combination of them they becomes a uh, linear functions um, but i can see here in the slide they haven't gave that and finally the model is fit to minimize um, the uh, error so uh, after all when we finish everything here um, we do many of the activation function to learn so the i think the one of the horsepower of this uh, um, neural network is this learning deck textlets here we use through the activation functions and now you actually use um you know a loss function here to find the uh, true but i mean to find the error between the prediction and the uh, actual value so this is uh, uh, what this means uh, here this is the prediction i think this is the true value and you can find uh, so what we I will always be trying is to minimize this um error right so we minimize this square error uh, in the yeah so um, anyone wants to add something before we go see the example i think i i have a question so why are yeah. activation functions um you mm -hmm. know like the sigmoid and uh relu right it, mm -hmm. it almost seems like they're trying to get some type of binary outcome right like a uh, yes no mm -hmm. go no go mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah so well. at, at that level right at the whatever hidden layer level mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um is it just i'm just trying to think about like um i know that they're named neural networks because they work in principle i i'm not exactly sure i think the book just said that um they sort of work in like a you know binary mode sort of like a neuron would fire like it either fires or it doesn't fire in action potential right mm -hmm. and so is is that what you're trying to do so in the hidden layer you're just trying to somehow weight all those inputs so that it's like a go no go signal after yeah, all think, of the transformation yeah i think this activation function like relu they are also sometimes as you are saying call them they are called squashing function so mm -hmm. Um, give it like um, I'm I'm I don't have that in top of my head why like we need to but they are also called squashing functions so whatever mm -hmm. they are within the range we need to squash them into given this range so for example we can see like anything mm -hmm. here that is non negative mm -hmm. is squashed here and which is, I, I think this is uh, relu right um, this is relu right and um, yeah. anything that is uh, you know is uh, so um, yeah um, anyone can add something maybe. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, part of also what I got out of the this discussion in the textbook was that, um, so like each of those nodes in the each hidden layer is going to mm -hmm. be doing some kind of transformation of the uh, output from the previous layer. Um, and then, and then the, and then each of those nodes, then the transformation each of those nodes is doing is then weighted by an activation function, I think. So like, I think mm -hmm. the, so I think the transformations are done by each of those nodes. And then the next stage, like, uh, takes, uh, some kind of, um, some kind of like combination or like, uh, weights on those weights that like, that, that was my understanding of, or that's how I had it in my head that. So like, so like the next step might not even use at all the 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 transformation that was done by like node one in that first hidden layer like and so I, I think it's something that's how I was thinking about it but maybe someone yeah. has a better better explanation to that but. also um well, these go go, yeah go ahead Brian. no go I was ahead. just gonna <laughs> add uh, something if I could to that discussion um the sigmoid is a mapping from like a real, you know, it's, we use this before logic, logistic regression or whatever, right? Yeah, it maps yeah, the yeah, real yeah. value to a zero to one, right? Log odds uh -huh. or whatever. Um, and that was inspired by like the neural activation, right? So like if, you know, it either fires or it doesn't fire, and this is kind of the probability that it fires, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's kind of been abandoned now. Now, the only thing really important is that it's something nonlinear. So that it'll, you know, won't be a, otherwise, if you don't have these nonlinear activation functions, you're not doing anything different than just making linear combinations and you, it won't actually learn 
any better than just like a linear fit, right? Right. So right. it's important to you. This is what I'm getting from the book, by the way, not from my own experience. <laughs> but so the ReLU is a nonlinear function, right? It's like flat and it goes up and has a little kink in it, right? Um, it's relatively straightforward. It's just linear greater than zero than zero when it's less than zero. But the important thing is that it's nonlinear and it's very easy to compute. Those are the two things yes, that people exactly. use ReLU so much. Mm -hmm. It's, it's both it. nonlinear and super easy, right? It's just, oh, mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. less than zero, then just squash it to zero. If it's greater than zero, take it what it is. It doesn't, by the way, it's not restricted to one on the ReLU, right? They just rescaled it so it, look, you could see it on the same scale of the, as a sigmoid on this plot. But the ReLU, you know, it can go up to whatever. There's no limit. It's just linear on the, on the Z. It, you know, when the Z is greater than zero, just output Z, except here they scaled it by something to make it so it goes to oh, one okay. at five or whatever, six, whatever the right hand of that scale is. So, but it is nonlinear. That's the key thing. Um, and by using ReLU, and then what they're trying to illustrate here is, hey, ReLU is not that different than the sigmoid and how its kind of shape is. It's nonlinear mm -hmm. um, in a similar way, but it's much easier to compute. I mean, just like I said, it's just a, a conditional rather than a, a bunch of exponentials, right? So that's kind of what I think the most important thing is the nonlinear aspect. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that that actually makes a lot of sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. In the book, okay. they give an example where they show, oh, look, if you use like the square function, which is like the simplest nonlinear thing you can do, then mm -hmm. you can see how all these interesting things can happen just by squaring a linear thing. You can actually mm -hmm. get interactions that weren't there before. As yeah. an example. So using nonlinear functions. Um, it, you will not learn anything, so it is the nonlinearity that matters that makes the stuff, um, you know, learn some stuff from persons to do. That's my take anyway. I think what I got out of the book anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so now they move to um, an example using MNIST dataset. Um, so the goal is they want to build a classifier predict the image class. So this are the other images and you, you know, you wanna whether this is this and um, they build a two layer network with um, two fastest unit and this other unit. Um, this is um, called, um, you know, we can see here we have two hidden layers and now we can see we have the output here. Um, so we can see 10 unit at output layer. So we have F1 to F9, we have 10 unit. And we can see along with the interval call bias, there are two, five, three parameters the first to way. So you can see here, we have the weights here um, along uh, this stuff. Um, so now seeing um, what is in, uh, input layer, hidden layer. Now they wanna look at what is uh, happening at the output layer. Um, so at the output layer here, we can see uh, also uh, we use activation functions to encode the output. So I think one of the uh, activation function they use normally at, um, usually at us, uh, output is softmax, uh, which allows you to do some kind of, um, you know, classify the output you have here whatsoever. So um we can see here um like um uh i i cannot um, um make an, uh, any anybody can explain this one what is happening here um yeah. this mathematical stuff <laughs> um yeah so anyway um this is um a submise activation function at the output layer and it's also trying to do some kind of uh, uh, uh classification for example you see if uh it's one is true plus for the vision of a, else is zero i'm just one hot encoded why we know some stuff like that so this is the results for the the experiment for doing this um you know image classification using two hidden layer neural networks and they combine the result of the experiment with um you know um classical or you know, statistical learning method um, where, for example, we can see neural networks um, plus rigid regression, neural network drop out. These guys, you can see the performance, right? So what they mean here by neural network plus rigid regression is that because we know neural networks is so um, 
uh, what you call a complex model, um, um, it can overpeat the training data. So we, so I think in some of the previous sessions, um, we can do regularization. So here they use rigid regression. One of the approach also to do um, regularization, it drop out regularization where you drop out some kind of new, um, some weights. Um, for example, here you drop some weight uh, from the connection. So this is uh, the, and now we can see the performance here, uh, the test error, this is it. Um, we can see the, um, you know, neural networks performs better, right, than all the other statistical approaches. Um, so um, we can see this uh, image classification is a problem that has been almost solved. Um, the error rate, you know, you can see is this, um, uh, but human error rate is supported to be this, but I believe maybe now they even achieve, you know, a beta. Uh, so this is one of the uh, example they show that you can use. Uh, so the main idea here is just to tell you uh, the Tokyo is that neural networks uh, basically solve or um, outperforms our, our classical machine learning uh, algorithm. I think that's the main takeaway here. And also the image problem, uh, uh, MNIST dataset is almost so problem. So they jump in into convolutional neural networks. Um, anyone wants to have something? I have a question. Um, Kevin, you said the nodes are dropped. Which are the nodes? Is it is that just the yes, exactly input yeah. layer X or yeah. no, 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 like A1, A2, or A3? Yeah, that, oh, okay. So, yeah, so it's not only because it is the node that is um, we apply the weight there. So, all the node, um, I think it, um, they discuss more about the dropout later in the. Yeah, that's and correct. I have a, a question, right? So they they're using um, the neural network plus ridge or dropout. Ah, uh, so okay, yeah. Hold on. So would lasso somehow not work because then you it doesn't somehow perform feature selection? I'm just mm. trying to understand. Like, is dropout regularization in like analogous? To um, where you're selecting certain things or not so, necessarily? So um, I forgot, for example, for the ridge regression. Okay. So I know for the ridge regression, maybe, um, you know, um, uh, maybe it, uh, you know, zero out some factors, right? Some, mm -hmm. you know, X, Y, X, some, so some stuff there are zeroed. So I think that's um, what is mean by I I don't I, I can't remember how the rigid regression um, uh, works, but there is using basically the idea of I think rigid regression where we you know uh, zero out some you know uh, futures I think uh, so that is it so that's why it's called rigid regularization because it's somehow because we know in linear regression we can use linear regression to do regularization how do we do that um, by zeroing out some you know uh, coefficient and so that the model becomes less uh, complex and now we can train uh, if we zero some uh, you know coefficient we can train the model and now the model may not overfit the training data so mm -hmm. yeah so it seems to me that then the, the ridge stuff would need to be happening at the activation function you know sorry it seems to me that the ridge in this like when you if you're incorporating ridge regularization to a neural mm -hmm. network then mm -hmm. it would be like zeroing out some of the uh, nodes at um, a given layer. You know oh yeah, I mean? mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I think it's it's got to be somehow a part of the activation function. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that you, that you're just using like a ridge like approach to uh, determine which uh, nodes get 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 like downweighted. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I don't. I yeah. I I don't think really they talked about the details of that. How you would do mm. that. they in the in a later part they do talk a little bit more about it. It's still in kind of general way, but it's actually in the loss function that you put it in. Just like oh, it in, is okay. in linear fitting, right? You put it in there. So whether it's ridge or lasso, is just whether it's L one or L two, and mm -hmm. sometimes lasso is used too. They mention as well. So it's actually at the end, as it were. Mm. Right. Interesting. Okay. Oh, or at least that's how they, maybe you could do it earlier, but in, in the, when they show it, they show it only being done at the end at the lot, lot in the loss function. And ridge is a little bit easier because you can take the derivative of uh, the square and you can't 
easily take derivative of the absolute value. So I know that lasso they do mention lasso can be used. I'm just not sure how it is used, but um, mm. but yeah, I guess you can take the derivative. Just you have to be careful around zero. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so we can see. <laughs> I don't know what's going with that. <laughs> yeah, so we can. At the very see... end, they mention it briefly. They show like a very general equation, like you know, with theta in there, whatever that is, but. Mm -hmm. Ron, sorry, can you uh, remind me again, where is the loss function? So I know it's like loss penalty usually, right? Um, yeah, it's that, you know, in the for case of classification, it's that P log P cross entropy thing, but, or it's, uh, cross, yeah. Got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or like, have, like the analogous or, RSS. Step yeah, RSS, in like, yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so now they move into um, CNN, uh, which is convolutional neural network. Um, so um, CNN, they said, um, one of the major success story of classifying images is using the CFAR dataset um, through competition, where also um, you know. Uh, People try to, you know, compete and you know do different kind of techniques to uh, for deep learning to solve the problem. And this is one of the data set they use. So here they want to tell us um, a bit about how they use uh, the CNNs to train this. So how does the CNN works? Um, so CNN is different. So we can see here we have seen um, just like a, a vanilla neural network, multilayer, uh, uh, I mean, neural network like this, but there are different kind of, uh, you know, architectures of neural networks. So you can see like you have RNN, you have CNN, convolutional neural network, you have like a transformer base. Um, now people, now they have moved from doing this, even CNN, RNN, now they move to doing what is called transformer base, which is uh, now the state of the art using, um, you know, like NLP and also moving to images. So now they want to explain this, how CNN works and how it learns. So the thing is uh, this CNN, this is how it works is for example, we have an image, we want to do classification. Um, the way it learns is that uh, it do some kind of hierarchical understanding through the images, uh, edges. So for example, this is Tiger. Now um, we will see like a lot of features here. And now they can, you know, what, uh, you know, some eyes, some part of the eyes. So you can see at the first level, um, first level, what the future understand is some stuff like, you know, some very bit um, something, you know, can you see here, we understand it. And the next layer, then the futures will start, you know, building of trying to see the, um, you know, more future. Uh, let, let me see. And then I can take CNN. Let me see. CNN. Um, CNN. Neural, net, neural network hierarchy. There is one. Uh, uh, okay, there is one image that I know maybe uh, is quite good. Uh, anyway, you wrote CC and it says CNM. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Uh, still. Um, Okay, yeah, let's move on. So uh, what this is telling you is uh, uh, that you learn the features in form of hierarchy. So for example, here, maybe we have two layers. You can see first layer and second layer. Then this first layer will learn some features, you know, not complex features. The second layer will learn more complex features, you know, and the side, this is how it goes. So this is um, why deep learning or neural network is somehow kind of layered you know, learning. So it's not each feature, each level, each, um, I mean, feature, each um, um, layer, what it learn is also related to what the other feature will, uh, layer will learn. So it's called layered uh, learning in some ways. So this is uh, how the CNN works. Um, but uh, uh, you can see at the end, the features now are assembled now to make a single stuff. Um, this hierarchical construction is achieved using what is called convolution and pooling. Um, so what is convolution? So this is convolution. Uh, um, anyway, um, CNN, this is the uh, architecture of CNN. So we can see, um, 
okay, this is the architecture of CNN. So given an input, we do what is called convolution plus ReLU. Then we do pooling. Then we keep doing convolution plus ReLU pooling. Uh, pooling we I thread this one until the number of layers we specify. Then finally we flatten the uh, our output and you know use fully connected layer to and apply soft mask on this fully connected layer to make classification. Um, so uh, what this um, if this is our input like this is a car we want to do classification which car is this? Uh, we can see like here we have several output here car truck van bicycle. Now the first thing is we do convolution. So what this convolution is? So if you look at this one here, uh, an example. So this is convolution. We can see um, at the explain here. Um, we you will be given a filter, and now your image. So what you need to do is convolve this filter with the image by doing multiplication, and this is what is happening. So you can see here we have filter with two um, yeah one uh, stuff. So um, another one example. Let me see. okay no no this one. So let's see. This is our image. We can see it so we can now take this guy and this guy, and now we get this number. So this is how the um, you know convolution works. Mm. Yep. So this matrix now that is formed, uh, now we do some kind of a, a, a multiplication within it and find a single number. So that's um, how this one here, we can see like we take this alpha, we do this times this, and we take this alpha, we um, we take alpha as well, I think, um, uh, alpha times A and B times B, B this one, and uh, C, uh, this one times so each one. Uh, I think in that example, it's taking the A, B, D, E square. A, so the B. top left, yeah. Okay. And then multiplying by the convolution filter to give this mm -hmm. first line in all of the yeah. image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. square by the convolution filter. Yeah, so you can see here, we take these, these, and these, and these. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes you can define uh, like, three by three, that's, so you can see here, we have two by two filter. So it means we will multiply by two by two here. And sometimes the filter will be three by three, then it, you know, so this is how, you know, um, as just we saw this one. So um, uh, that's how this dance. And now the filters are learned during training. So this is what it means that our filters now this filter, they are somehow kind of the weight that uh, learn during the cleaner. So this is an example of our convolution. Uh, uh, for example, here you can see um, they said um, two filters are shown here: highlight vertical and horizontal strata. So these filters, uh, we know um, they represent different things. So they are matrix. Um, the matrix can be um, like a, a negative. They can be um, positive so um you know remember like a matrix that represent a rotation there is a matrix that represent like um uh, uh what do i call it um you know uh, different um kind of matrix so this matrix that we're talking here you can see a vertical here is horizontal so there is different representation of matrix that can the filter that can give us horizontal that the filter that give us vertical and now that a filter that can give us ages, maybe let me see, um, CNN filters, uh, CNN, I see CCN, CNN filters. Uh, um, I, I have a question, sorry. So yes. when they say, you know, the, the convolution filters are learned during training, mm -hmm. what exactly is it picking up on if it doesn't know anything about the images? Uh, you said, okay, let me cover. You say what? So it says the filters, right? So I'm imagining convolution filters are learned during the training, right? So then it will fill in this matrix, whatever values ah, are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is it picking up from the images? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that part I, I don't understand. Uh, okay, so here you can see we do, um, you know, multiply with this. So the idea, I think what they are doing is 
we want to capture different part of the image. So this one here, we can see like this is um, how three by three, right? But it turns out that is uh, we trim it down to three by two. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, also, I, I think I understand how the mm -hmm. uh, convolving mm -hmm. part works, mm -hmm. but how does it determine, you know, what values to put for alpha, beta, gamma, and delta during training? Like, mm -hmm. how does it learn that? I, I think, well, I think part, <laughs> yeah, and, and it, I think they're like randomly initialized to start and then. Oh, yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's correct. That's correct. Um, uh, yeah, that's correct. So because, you know, um, the neural network is somehow, so any, um, any uh, value or um, parameter that we learn during training, um, in some way we um, initialize it randomly. And the Got first it. prediction, okay. the first prediction we do is garbage. I mean, what I mean by garbage is some nonsensical, it will not give you a correct good ONIA to the correct um, uh, uh, ground truth. What we can do is we now um, use back propagation, go back now and look at these filters that this year guy, you didn't give me a correct result. Now we compare with the lost and now find out where can we move, can we change it to make sure that the next iteration reduces the error. Now Got we it, update. okay. Now we update. That makes our, sense. We do some update, now we go on to another iteration um, so you can train a deep learning, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, multiple iteration epoch, you know, 20, 50, 60, until it converts to uh, base optimal parameters. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it's given like a, so you give it, you set it up with like the structure with layers and convolution mm -hmm. sizes and stuff. And then it randomly initializes. And then like, as Ron said, yeah, gradient descent to try to figure out what the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the best that's weights are. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the book says like a convolution layer can be thought of as a dense layer, but very highly restricted, like extra structure added onto it. Mm. Um, convolution layer can be what? Thought of as just a, a very restricted dense layer, a dense layer with very restricted weights. Mm. Isn't that, doesn't it say, boy, but I wonder if it doesn't say anything. You, okay? Your response mm. makes me think I got that wrong, but I think it, I think they said that. Mm. What, that do, what do you mean by a dense layer, Ron? Well, a dense layer is just, you know, any, any possible matrix that is not sparse. Right? Yeah. Oh, you know, it, oh, the dense layer is like the normal, okay, okay, the okay. normal layer, right? They call that a dense layer because every possible linear, okay. every possible weight is there, right? Got it. Uh, anyway, I thought they said something like that. Oh yeah, the other time this is the kind of the image I want to show, like how the CNN, you know, um, yeah, do the learning. Um, it learns some features along the way. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Um, so yeah. So that's this and. Uh, well, Okay. Um. It is amazing to me though, that the, the thing that comes out of that process is like this like hierarchical kind of buildup uh, mm -hmm. type of thing with images, you know, like, like lines and like, you know, like, you know, and then building up to like more complex objects as it goes through the, mm. um, the layers, like as it goes down. Um, that's amazing to me that like yeah yeah that it like it which is similar to how the human like visual yeah exactly works. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah yeah yes mm -hmm. yeah so which is yeah which is incredible uh, to me <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah they built it inspired by brain neural architecture yeah. like the brain brain's architecture but still that it that it's I don't know, like uh, extracting like those like fundamental like building blocks and then building up as it goes through the network is really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. So the last, the another one they talk about is pooling. Um, we can see like the pooling also, uh, which um, you know we do different kind of pooling, which sharpen the futures identification. So what this means is that uh, 
now when we have uh, from so uh, when we uh, see this uh, okay okay when we have this um we have convolution um and the ruler is acted on it then we have pooling right so we have a pooling here and now then we have another convolution then we have pooling so here we can see um we have what is called um, different kind of pooling. We have like max pooling. So the idea is this. Now, if we are using a two by two block, now we can take this block, this and this and this, one, two, three, zero. Now we identify what is the maximum of within this. So three is maximum, right? So this is called max pooling. So what does this mean is that um, imagine this as some kind of uh, you know point for the image whatsoever. Now the max pooling, is somehow the one with the highest sharpen, you know, uh, future that is so con construct to, you know, that is in the future that is more visible within this, you know, uh, point range. So that's max fooling. Um, there is also a kind of average fooling. So we can see like uh, now we reduce the size. Um, yeah. Oh, this is the future. Uh, yeah. So this is an example of what I was giving, talking about the max fooling. Uh, so you can see here we have um, max pooling. Max, so it's taking the maximum. And now here we have what is called average pooling, which is basically taking the average of them, you know, uh, combine, uh, uh, yeah, something like that. I think it is also average, it's three plus two. Uh, this is not average, right? Okay, maybe it's not average. Hmm. I thought it's average pooling. Um, but I, what I know, like previously, like yeah, because it, 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 there's four cells, so it equals twelve. So twelve. Ah, to oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we have what is called stride. So stride is like what tells us how many shift we do. So here you can mm -hmm. see like two by two. This is a stride, um, the, which is I think, um, um, yeah. So this is um. Uh, the pooling. So two things that discuss about we can see like we have uh, within this convolution we do convolve, then we do pooling, convolve, pooling, convolve. Then finally, after everything we finish uh, pooling, we flatten the final layer and now do classification at the end. So you can see like when we flatten, he had like uh, some kind of five hundred whatsoever. And so, some question yeah. for the. Yeah. Sorry, the pooling, to me, it kind of seems like a little bit like downsampling, like yeah. downsampling mm -hmm. an image. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. like if you were to do that on like a raw image, um, that was transformed into some kind of a numerical form, and then you made it an image again, it would just be kind of like a blurrier version of that image, right? Yeah, but um, yeah, yeah, I understand what you say. Like, uh... is that right? Or I don't know. <laughs> Um, um, so I, uh, um, uh, I don't have the quad feature right now, but what I was thinking, like, um, um, I don't know, I don't have this actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, you can see the pooling, why, uh, pooling, why, why doing the pooling, I think, uh, may answer the questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I sort of have a question from what Kevin just said and then what Ron put in, in the mm -hmm. chat, right? So mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is, uh, what's the difference between average and max pooling in terms of like the types of, so what I'm thinking is like, Kevin, you're saying it's it's sort of like down sampling, right? Mm -hmm. um, it makes sense because it, it would be like a blurrier version or, or less resolution version, right? Of whatever information you had prior to the pooling. But also, for example, I was just thinking, right? If you are trying to determine an edge where you have like black and then white on a, on a different side. So maybe that this highlights that contrast, right? Because edges can be features, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, max pool give you a much higher contrast. Than yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get areas. the, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, I have I can remember this when I read it somewhere else. This is one of the, um, you know, the average fullies had this. Uh, yeah, so we can see like here, pulley layers are used to reduce dimension of the future maps that we have that it reduce the number of parameters to learn and the amount of competition for form in the mm -hmm. network. 
the fully layer summarize the future present in a region of the future mass generated by convolution. So mm -hmm. they are just you know doing summer summer summarizing the futures uh, as we so. Um, to me, yeah. to mm -hmm. me, what's confusing about it is like, obviously, this is just done by like, you know, like I when you get to like, uh, you know, you do a transformation on the original image that's like a matrix, right, mm -hmm. of values, and mm -hmm. then you get some new. After one layer, it's like some transformed image. Um, then, like like when it's taking the max or the average, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it seems to imply that like higher values are like more important or something, or like, are, you know what I mean? Like why not the min uh, value, like, like, like maybe, maybe like the absence of color really matters or, you know, like, like why, I, I just don't quite get, I, I'm having a hard time intuitively saying like why max or average is like important um you know are there other kinds of pooling like like uh, yeah yeah you know? there are other kind of pooling it's not only two poolings um i think um there are other okay. ones yeah so you can see here this is what they're saying um about map pooling the output after max pooling layer will be future map contain the most prominent features of the previous future map mm -hmm. so um what, what does Max mean? Hmm. Okay. Oh, there is min pooling. To, okay. Yeah, there is. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the issues with this, right? With neural networks, there's a lot of tinkering. And I mean, I mean, it's like, oh, maybe <laughs> I should try this, or maybe I should try that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Like, it's not like, um, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, we have mini oh, pooling. Yes. Yeah. You know what, I, what I'm wondering, since this is all like in the context of like, in a sense, like classification of images, right? And it's very similar to visual processing in humans because that's what you're trying to extract, right? In, in the environment, you're trying to extract, say, some type of feature that would indicate if it's, you know, an animal or a rock, you know. So if you're going to run away or if something is harmless, and so like in the um, what am I call it the medium article that Ron just put in the chat, and they're showing, you know, either average pooling or max pooling. I think that it sort of bear with me, right? But if you were a B or whatever, then maybe, you know, min pooling would work for you. Whereas for us, the one with the max pooling where the the flower is really bright is more important to us, right? Or at least that's what I would want to see. Like if it were a predator or something, or mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like the more striking features that make sense for us mm -hmm. in what we I need mean to see. I think it I depends. Yeah. It depends on what your what your label is, you know, that you're predicting. Right. You know, because like because like if if the, the label was some somehow a classification based on how uh, I don't know how like uniform the image is, or mm -hmm. like how or like like how bland it is, or how like I don't know. Like I can imagine cases where you wouldn't care about the intensity of like the color or or contrast mm -hmm. or I don't know like I think it really is up to whatever you're trying to optimize for you know what's the that's true so I'm wondering like, so maybe the question yeah. should have been like in these image classifications right what were they trying to what is their end goal predict. right yeah mm -hmm. predict or or you know for what purpose if if yeah. even there is such a thing right yeah I mean uh like I can imagine like the handwriting example like mm -hmm. you're gonna want to you know enhance the darker area and um, minimize the lighter area to incre increase the contrast so that the letter form or number form or whatever comes out right. better. Right. So I can imagine yeah. like you want some kind of a pooling process where you're, or, con or con convolution and pooling, I guess, but like where you're in certain regions of the image, like, you know, um, uh, taking the the most dominant like thing that's happening in that in, in most color the most dominant color or whatever that's happening in that yeah. image. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry uh, or to that, like that, evolutionary region, speculation. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I wonder like if uh and this I can just Google this, but since we're talking, I'll just say it. But um like is there a, a way in one of these architectures where 
you let the model choose like based mm. in a certain layer what kind of pooling it uses like is it do you have to mm -hmm. define you know what kind of pooling is used at different steps or um you know like does it or, or i guess you could just try you know but what if like it's best at like after the first convolution layer to use max pooling and then after the fourth to use min pooling you know like like hybrid yeah i don't know I have a question. So when they started these projects, right, like image classification, were they just looking to see whether like these types of like, you know, uh, neural nets could actually classify with high accuracy, like a human would classify with like, was that the benchmark? Yeah, I think, well, I think that's how the labels are generated, you know, right. Like okay. humans are looking at it. So I think for a lot, I think for most of these, yeah, the benchmark or the, the thing that it's trying to replicate with image classification is like a human label. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, so you can see, Kevin, like <laughs> what you are talking about, you can do like um, um, this kind of combining this. Uh, uh, somebody is asking, in which scenario will you want to two adjacent fully layers? So you can see it's possible that you could have, for example, mean mm. followed by a max or mean. What this could mm -hmm. be combined, the idea of reducing the dimensionality of your data from holistic perspective with the main pool and then choosing the best of your upgrade with max pool. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, but it sounds like you might need to 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 specify that in your architecture. Yeah, I think yeah. You know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can um, then but if you have like a reasonable number of layers, you could just run each variation through it, you know, mm -hmm. and see which one is best. But is it very time consuming to do that? Uh well, I think it depends you, on how much data you have and what your yeah, computer looks yeah. like. But, right. Okay. So um, what, for example, GPU like, or something. Right, 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 right. Okay. But say just, you know, an, an average person um, trying this at home um, and you have this, uh, the data set that is given for this image classification example, like, mm -hmm. like a I, thing where it's a few minutes. Um, I think in the book, they said that uh -huh. on a laptop, Maybe it was, I don't know which data set it was. Maybe it was mint, the mints, the handwriting one, but it took like two minutes mm -hmm. or something. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, I mean, deep learning required this kind of, you know, um, back and front, try this, you know, and, you know, and yeah. So what this means mm -hmm. here, when they say pooling is performed in neural network to reduce variance and computation complexity. Yeah, we understand now computation complexity reduced. What do they mean by reduced variance in this context? Hello? Yeah, I mean. Sorry, yeah, I'm thinking of a. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, if you take the, the so, same oh, variance, no. we're talking about the bias variance trade off, right? The overfitting. Um, I think is why, right? It just reduces the number of parameters and helps reduce overfitting a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but when we do like, when we do um, uh, maybe mean pooling, we take the minimum. We are not talking about, I think, I, I'm not sure like how, anyway. Oh, okay. Because we are reducing the size from the, uh, the previous layer. Um, the convolution layer, we are reducing it to small. Is that what you mean? Like is well, or at least not increasing it, right? Because what's going to happen? You're going to pool, and then you're going to convolve again. So you're going to add, yeah, you're going to create more <laughs> layers, right? So uh -huh. you better you better reduce things now, otherwise things are going to ah. get out of hand really quickly. Because <laughs> ah. right? you know we're going to convolve, pool, convolve, pool, convolve, mm -hmm. and then finally pool and flatten it. So every time you convolve, we're adding more and more layers, mm -hmm. um, not layers. We're adding more and more depth, I guess, right? And making it more or complex. Those, more those squares in that stack, right? That's what I'm saying. So, mm -hmm. in fact, they, they say that, right? You, the point is to reduce, because uh, you're going to more filters, you better reduce the dimension of the image so you don't have an out of control situation in terms of parameters. You have an out of control variant situation because you have way so many parameters, right? Mm -hmm. That's my interpretation. But that's right. usually what they do, right? Every time they, they pool, then they convolve it. So, contract, expand, contract, expand, right? 
Mm. Cool. Anyway, okay. Um, so that's her CNN. Um, ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is why we're gonna take two weeks to do this chapter, I think, because it's quite involved, right? <laughs> I, don't know, like, I, I honestly wouldn't mind. I I really <laughs> loved. I only got through half of it, the first half, but I loved reading it. So, <laughs> so I mean, we are just discussing a lot, and the time has gone. <laughs> That's good, though. That's great to discuss a lot. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, we can definitely continue next week with the. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe we still have a couple minutes, but. Um, Okay. Let uh, me LSTMs just... are like a whole nother thing. Yeah, right? it's a whole topic, right? Those are really, uh, really interesting so too. Can we go through this or we can stop? Yeah. Here? Yeah, go, go for it. Okay. We have a few so, minutes. Okay. So using pre-trained network to classify images. So here you can see you have CNN. So I was telling you like we have different kind of stuff in deep learning. Um, this is CNN and we'll see RNN. So that is what is called pre-trained networks. So what does that mean? Um, we train in is that um, somebody, for example, Google or whatsoever big giant tech company, they train a network with billions of images, with you know, um, billions of parameters. And now if you want to train your image, for example, here you can see like they train the images, multiple images, you can see different kind of images. Um, it turns out that maybe you want to um, you know, train a classifier, but for doubt. So there is high chances that the image that has been, and the pre-trained network that has been trained, there was image in it. But even though, even if there is no image of the task at hand you want to do, um, it will benefit from the pre-trained network, some of the features of images, and it can have a good accuracy for that. So this is um, what they mean by pre-trained um, uh, Yeah, and just to, just to add one thing to this, like yes. the, Mm -hmm. uh in this there's this book i don't know if you guys are familiar with it called fast ai uh, or fast yeah. ai mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and uh and i was working, th working through it a long time ago um or like a year ago and i want to come back to it so i got through part of it but part of his like he talked he like the beginning of the book it's like supposed to motivate you to show you the power of these things and like mm -hmm. you, you use these pre-trained networks and then you fine tune in like another yes. step on top of mm -hmm. that network for mm -hmm. your data set. And I did it with like some random like plot output that I wanted to, this like pattern that I made like just from statistics of like this, these like um, user sessions or whatever and classify it by like the type of device they were using. Um, anyway, and it was like super accurate, it was really cool. Um, so there's a ton of power in doing that where you like take this really robust pre-trained network, fine tune it in another step, like another layer basically for your specific uh, data set and then like use it to make predictions and they're incredible um, a lot of the mm -hmm. time. So yeah. anyway, that's like a lot of what they do in that fast AI book. And I think it's really cool because it shows you right away the power of these methods, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. without having to have, you know, the computational power of Google or whatever. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Kev, you want to start a new book club for that book? That sounds really it's cool. In, it's in Python, but uh, I was, oh, I'm, okay. it's a little okay. sad that it's not in R, but like, yeah. I mean, still, we can do a Python book club, but because um, there is. I Python really, I really, chat, so if you, um, I it's really a great love book. book. Um, yeah. What Fast Kevin AI. was saying, yeah, what Kevin was saying, I also did it. Um, it's a great book. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to get fastest way to deep learning, I think that's the easiest road. Because mm -hmm. you know, no any kind of much. Um, the concept the, is okay. Go on, Kevin. Oh, go ahead. No, I didn't change. Uh, um, the concept he's using is called is it top down or bottom up? No, top down. So meaning like you don't need to care about those mathematics. Just shows you how to do the stuff. Later on, mm -hmm. when you get the good intuition, um, you can come back and learn the mathematics because like he was given an example like. When you go to football match, um, foot, you want to learn a, um, you know, you go to a football um, uh, field. Nobody teach you how to kick a football. You just go and um, you know, kick the football, right? And you start learning. And you don't go to the class to learn the rules and you know all the for them uh, learn how to play uh, football. So that's the idea he has top down. So if you want to learn, just give you the you know top you know learn how those stuff works. I really like mm -hmm. the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, go and yeah. 
yeah i really like that that like pedagogical approach teaching approach um it's actually if you've read the r packages book they have a chapter at the beginning called the whole game exactly where, where you like go from a to z and you like make a package right away and this is the same idea except with neural net so oh. it's like you 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 do the whole process of like training you know and and finalizing and predicting and you know evaluating uh, all end to end in like the second chapter um and mm -hmm. uh and then but as sham is saying like the idea is like then you become interested in like oh how does this work how does that work mm -hmm. you know, like go yeah. to go into mm -hmm. deeper and deeper but that you're mm -hmm. seeing why it's so powerful from the beginning instead mm -hmm. of instead of like having to learn all this other math to like it, before you open your own gates of your mind to allow yourself to do neural nets you know like so right and like right. it's really neat like apparently a lot of his students have won like awards at like exactly you know, yeah at like yeah. At like forecasting competitions and mm -hmm. you know data mm -hmm. science competitions and like it's a really powerful instructional approach like I don't know if I were to learn deep learning, like one, like from scratch, uh, which I am basically, um, I would, I would read that book. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. it's a little bit sad that it's not an R at all, but, but it's still. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not an R. Um, I listen, I once like share with it in, in this, in the r and a lot of people share interests, like they want to go through it when we have time, like, uh, yeah, in the, Python thing channel that I share. Let's do this. And um, yeah, okay. Let's go. Question on this slide 14. So, um, you know, I, I was super surprised that when the image of the Cooper's Hawk is like zoomed out, right? Then the accuracy goes way down. I, I guess it's um, as a human, it's very intuitive that the thing that you should be focusing on is the bird, right? As opposed to the fountain. So, is there must be ways, right? That you I only see of... fountains. <laughs> <laughs> I see wrong. <laughs> okay. I reject um, your premise. <laughs> but is there a way then that you could wait? So, for example, right? If um, it's having an issue between the fountain and the hawk, you, sh you can just tell the network, like, no, we're looking at animals. So just discard objects. <laughs> Or, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, that's called the fine tuning. I, I'm not sure, like, um, um, mm -hmm. when you when you have free trained networks, um, mm -hmm. that has been trained on multiple, um, you know, images whatsoever. Now, if you want to train and classify something, maybe, uh, whatsoever it is, a sample of your annotated data, then you fine tune the network, tell the network that this is the example you I want you to learn do learn combine with the learning you the, some of the weight you learn some of your knowledge and now combine with this learning mm -hmm. that i'm giving you mm -hmm. to learn so that mm -hmm. way the model will learn from these few example and now you know override the existing but he the model can still benefit from some of the features because um you know images are images pixel are pixels and some can benefit in some ways um yeah 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 i, I see okay I'm more interested in the fact that I had a 12% prediction it might have been a nail. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty funny. That is true. Or a hook. <laughs> or a hook, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Deep learning libraries are Python focused. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Ron, um, yeah. Um, uh, in R, I mean, you cannot have, the, we don't have those powerful libraries like PyTorch, and you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think they are working toward those PyTorch and other stuff, right? But anyway, deep learning is Python. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I mean, it's for oversimplification, but it's a good starting point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's 70% Python and 12% nail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think my neural network's malfunctioning. Yeah. Seems yeah, to I be working like that one in the book. <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you heard that joke where people are like, uh, like, oh, I read a book today, so I trained a neural network, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, one. yeah, Ke Kevin, um, uh, really, his stuff is really inspirational. I, yeah, that's correct. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. Anyway, maybe one, one day, maybe, maybe after this book, we can go and read. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, I think, 
we are already on top of the hour. And I would and I would say if, even if you've never done anything in Python, um, his code examples and like the library make it it's really not that bad. It, you know, yeah. you work mm -hmm. through the book. So um yeah. but I've only yeah. gone through like three chapters, but um it's still uh <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm happy when if there is interest to go through the book, I'm happy to go through it as well. Um, so I think uh, uh, we are on top already. Hour maybe we can stop here and continue next week. Yeah, that sounds like a good stopping. Point. Yeah, it works for me. Yeah, okay, since, that'd be great. yeah. He uses his okay, movie database you, um, for the RNNs too, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. yeah. So sh Sham, are okay, you okay? So thank you. I I really enjoyed it. <laughs> today. We have, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for your presentation. Um, are you okay to continue next week? Like Hello? with the rest? Can you hear me? Hello. I can hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Continue oh. with the um the next week. with with yeah, the rest the of the chapter. Week. She'll be here. You'll be able yeah. to do it. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, then we'll see you next week. And I guess we should okay. probably start the lab too. So that if we at the end of the next time we can talk about the exercises as well, mm -hmm. right? So uh, what do you say, Kevin? Through, we should do the lab uh, also, okay. like, okay, like yes, start, yes. at least start start it because I don't okay. think the end of the chapter is going to take the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does maybe some sense. Sense. Um, uh, What do you think? Do you think we can just next week do the lab? Is that what you are saying? No, no, no. Us? So finish okay. the chapter, finish the content, okay. but okay. like L L LSTM and recurrent neural networks. But then, okay. but then also, if we have time, like we, we should do try out some of the exercises ourselves before okay. next Sunday, and then we okay. can talk about some of them if we have time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's what Thank I'm saying. You. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask a, a question? And um, whoever needs to leave, please feel free. Um, I don't mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. keep anybody. But you know, I was watching. Um, I've been fascinated with that uh, AlphaGo. You guys have seen wow. that documentary, right? Yeah, I yes. watched it. Yes. Okay. okay. So I was I was watching again yesterday. I think like the interview with uh, I think it's David Silver on Lex Friedman, and uh -huh. he was talking a little bit a lot about this uh, reinforcement learning idea, uh -huh. right? So do all of these like deep learning methods sort of include that reinforcement learning? Yeah. So reinforcement learning is um, some kind of um, um, subset of Okay, so deep learning, you can have um, uh, machine learning, you can have, you know, mm -hmm. um, supervised learning, unsupervised and reinforcement learning, right? So mm -hmm. reinforcement learning is different, you know, uh, subset of machine learning that deals with, uh, you know, agent and other stuff, related stuff. So I don't have much idea about reinforcement learning anyway. Sandra, there's a book out called Deep Learning in the Game of Go that... Um, uh -huh. I did go through part of it. It's pretty entertaining. It's pretty interesting, but it does explain exactly how this, uh, well, at least how AlphaGo works. Um, I see. You, okay. It actually builds up the whole thing in there. Oh, nice. But you can't, I mean, to run it on a regular computer, it turns out to be impossible. But for me, anyway, my computer couldn't do it. But right, to train right, it, I mean, right. it's okay. a lot of training. It's a lot of self-play. The game has to, you know, it has to play itself a lot and then learn from that. So. Right, 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 right. And then I, th I think the other thing that they kept talking about is like, um, so you know how um, actually they fed them like actual games. So it's like humans played yes. games and then it got trained on that. But then later on, it just has no input from like human players or anything. It just learns by itself, I guess. By you playing know, itself, by, yeah. They call it, they call it self, yeah. self play in the book. Yeah, they just do they have the, the network play itself and yeah, and then learn from that. That that's so like it's mind very cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. That's magic. I... <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah, how it found yeah. these strategies. It found strategies right. that no human had ever thought of. Like, oh, I would never right. play that. <laughs> that's right, crazy. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. And then I think that um, they were making a distinction between, like, you know, like the very early. Um, I guess it was called like tree-based searches, right? Right. And how um, they, in a sense, developed this other way for the so instead of doing exhaustive searches it's sort of this reinforcement learning where it's playing against itself and then learning whatever rules it needs to oh, learn yeah. but then mm -hmm. i think that eventually they also added something called a monte carlo tree search and i was like what is that so what <laughs> do you know like what is a monte carlo yeah tree it's, it's based i mean i spent a while so I, I looked through that book but 
basically okay. it's just guessing <laughs> right oh okay. just guess different moves and then whatever you look at the and then at some point you stop and you evaluate how good no i'm sorry you you uh you evaluate a game so you play like a couple moves like is this move better well what if we just both sides just made random moves all the way until the end of the game who won oh, and okay. do that many 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 times and somehow yeah. that's actually able to give you insight in which position is better right it seems like ma- it's another thing that seems like magic. It's like, wait, it's just randomly playing. How's that going to tell you anything? But it turns out it does work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's also just like astounding to me, right? Because it's like. But that book goes into a lot more detail thing. about the, about that Monte Carlo yeah. tree search too. I just forgot now. Problem with my neural network in my head is it learns things and then it falls right back out again. <laughs> <laughs> and and then it identifies fountains. Yeah. And <laughs> nails, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, I I was just watching that yesterday, I think, because this chapter made me think about that. And so I went and watched that. And I was just like, wow, this amazing. it is amazing. I mean, for a long time, Go was almost impossible to uh, beat mm-hmm. human mm-hmm. the best players you couldn't do with AI. Now, all of a sudden, the best player is an AI. So that's yeah. quite a change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Go I think... players used to be so proud of the fact that the Go, Go is better than chess because you know what? No yes. computer can beat the best player. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It was a very bittersweet to watch that documentary because I was just like, "Go, Ishidol, go!" You know, and and it's sort of like he did his best, but it it God, just is it on Netflix? Happened, so. Yeah, I think it's is on YouTube. On, on oh, YouTube. Okay, YouTube, yeah. What is it called? Alpha Go, the documentary. Okay, I don't know if I've seen it. I, think... I might want to watch it. Oh, oh you right. should, Kevin. It's Kevin, like one of the most it. riveting oh. sporting events I've seen. <laughs> what, when I was watching, when I was watching, I said, "What?" Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Excitement and the way they do the recording is, I mean, the old, I mm-hmm. mean, the whole plan is was really amazing. Um, yes, you know, yes. Yeah, I really like it. <laughs> I watched it once, then I had to watch it with a friend, and then I watched it again. <laughs> yeah, oh, <wow>. me too. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll have to watch it. Thanks for the rec. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got it. I gotta go. I got it. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Talk to you next week. See you in a week. Bye. Bye.